Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to tonight's uh, Infrastructure Safety and Growth Scrutiny Committee meeting. Um, our first item on the agenda are apologies. Um, I've received no apologies. I think we're a full house tonight, so uh, we'll, we'll crack on. Um, item two are the minutes of the previous meeting, which was the 23rd of August, I believe. Um, so uh, thank you, Councillor Ford. Looking for a second there. Thank you, John. Um, I will. All those in favour? Brilliant. I shall sign those off as a correct record. Item three are declarations of interest. I assume we're all interested and nobody has any specific personal interests. Thank you. Uh, item four is an update from me. I have nothing to update committee on that's not on the agenda or won't be um, updated within the working group updates. So um, item five is responses to reports of the Infrastructure Safety and Growth Scrutiny Committee. Um, while there was, there's not any formal um, responses to reports, the, um, the recommendations that we made on the Community Involvement and Local Development Scheme report and the Local Plan Issues and Options Consultation report that I presented to um, Cabinet, all those all those items and concerns were taken on board and um, included within the the report, so they didn't really need a, a separate separate recommendation. Um, item six is consideration of matters referred to infrastructure safety and growth from Cabinet or Council, and there are none. So we're on to our first substantive um, item, which is the net zero carbon baseline report um i'm very excited to to see this we've got a presentation and i'm going to um, ask jeremy and anna to um to introduce so jeremy thank you mr chairman um yes yeah, so quite an exciting moment uh back in november 2019 uh, in this uh, in this room we declared a climate change emergency uh, and in february 2021 uh, the Cabinet released some contingency to do this initial piece of work uh, when they accepted the, uh, uh, the roadmap. Uh, so what we've got here today is the results of step one of the uh, net zero carbon uh, project. Uh, and this is the production of a, uh, of a baseline uh, for us to work from. Um, we can all do our bit uh, in terms of net zero, but we need to know where we're starting from. Uh, so, so this is what we've got in front of us. I'm not going to say any more because this is the first uh, reception we've had to the con consultants uh, coming through your committee uh, initially and then going on to, to Cabinet as appropriate. Uh, so I'm just going to hand over to Anna and the consultants to present what they've found. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, yes, this is the first step of two steps. Um, to uh, enable us to be a net zero carbon authority, which was the ambition in the declaration. So this first step provides us essentially with what that goal is, what that endpoint is, it's a baseline, it gives us a target um, against which we can actually measure our progress and determine if we've, if we've achieved um, that overall corporate objective. Um, to do that, um, I commissioned some consultants through a competitive tendering process, oh, about a year ago now, um, the work was completed in May, and we've got, we've got three very lovely ladies here today who are going to talk us through um, the report. So not just the outputs and some of the suggested recommendations for embedding climate change work into the local authority activity. They're also going to talk through just some of the terminology, um, importantly, because it's a really technical and very specialist area. Um, but they're going to also talk through the methodology, how we arrived at the study that we've got to, and then the outputs with a set of recommendations. Um, I would say, though, that step two, which is an action plan, which is yet to be commissioned, is the sort of the detail um, of how we as an authority move forward and make the more difficult decisions around what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, the timescales, the milestones, and what, most importantly, the resourcing, i.e. the finances that will support any strategy that we've got. So I would like to introduce... Uh, I've got three colleagues here. 
I've got um, Lady in Red, Liz Warren, <laughs> Lady in the Middle uh, is Courtney, Courtney Santos, and I've got Kirsten May right on the very, very end, who will take it in turn to explain you know, what they've done through the presentation in front of you. So thank you. Questions at the end. Thanks, Anna. Perfect. Right, step one. I think the microphone is on. Um, right, thanks very much for inviting us to speak this evening. Um, I think through everyone will really enjoyed this project and looking forward to this meeting to present it back to you all today. Um, first slide, please. Um, just briefly to introduce the team, I'm Kirsten May and I'm a consultant from a company called Ether. Um, we're based in Oxford but are now sort of scattered around um, the UK in this new brave new world of remote working um, we're sort of climate change emissions um, consultants um, and we've over the last few years been providing a lot of support to local authorities like yourselves who are trying to define this path to net zero um, next slide please thanks um, today in this presentation um, as Anna said we're going to start with a little bit of the wider context what are the key terms that we talk about when we're discussing climate change um, and a little bit about what net zero at the UK level looks like. Um, and then we'll be then taking you through the work that we've done specifically for Tamworth. So that's establishing the evidence base and that's really into the data. What are the current emissions associated with the Tamworth Borough Council estate? Um, I think we'll probably stop then if that's okay, just to field off any questions that um, arrive from that section of the presentation. And then we'll move into um, the sort of recommendations part of the first steps for embedding climate action. Hand. <laughs> it is quite small. Everybody just talk amongst themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking that. That's actually not much text on that one. <laughs> Huddling. <laughs> Anna, would you like me to pause the meeting? Yeah. I can pause the meeting. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Can we? It's take me a while to get everyone's names in. So. Jody, can we pause the meeting? Is that possible, yeah. please?
Okay, we're uh, we're back live again. Um, we just had some technical issues, so uh, that's just for the benefit of those people that are watching. Um, okay, we'll we'll continue. We we all have the presentation in front of us now, so we can we can see it. So, Great. Uh, thank all you. right. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Um, perfect. So. We'll start then just by thinking about these key definitions, and I apologise if these are, are really obvious to everybody in the room, but just thought we'd make sure that everyone's clear on these before we move forward. So net zero, which is of course the key part of the, the declaration that you made, means the balancing of emissions with the result being zero. So on the left hand side of those charts there, you'll see a sort of zero carbon, a sort of true zero situation, if you like, by in the target year. Um, for illustration, sorry, this does say 2040, but I'm aware that yours is 2050. Um, there are zero emissions. In the net zero situation, you can see there's that blue bar sort of in the negative, and so that's illustrating a sort of offsetting mechanism. And so that could be through um, removal of CO2 emissions, sort of um, naturally through sequestration, so um, through sort of trees and planting, or um, through other offsetting mechanisms. Um, a greenhouse gas or GHG inventory um, is a data set which presents all the emissions within a boundary. So that boundary might be national and there are national inventories um, produced, um, or in this case it is the Tamworth Council Estate. Um, CO2E is the sort of metric that we use, um, so that is a way of making equal all of the different greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so that includes CO2 but then also um, emissions of methane or other CFCs, PFCs that um, also have a warming effect in the atmosphere. But we talk about CO2e um, as the single unit. Um, and then decarbonisation, so that's the process of reducing the carbon intensity of an activity. So um, a good example is thinking about the decarbonisation of the grid. Um, in your house you might not be using less electricity, but the electricity that you are using is less carbon intensive because it's coming from a different source. So that's what that process sort of refers to. So I think that's all the sort of jargon busting for now. Um, and we'll move to the next slide, please. Okay, so just briefly a little bit about context about net zero in the UK. So the UK was actually the first major economy to pass legislation for net zero. Um, and our national target is for 2050. Um, and this was in, cordon, in accordance with the science um, that was sort of officially recognised in the Paris Climate Agreement with the aim to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, as it's recognised that even with that level of warming, the impacts of climate change will be um, severe. The map on the left shows you all of the local authority um, in the UK who have declared climate emergencies and the sort of colouring, although it probably is quite hard to see definitely on that screen, but hopefully you get some detail on your own screens um, at the different target dates that have been set. So there's a real range um, from some very ambitious targets for 2024 up to 2050. Next slide, please. And just in case any, anybody had forgotten, um, this is, of course, what you declared um, yourselves in Tamworth. Um, and these are really the parts, the key parts that we were covering as part of our project. So looking at um, the activities of the council itself and what the current emissions are um, and looking at ways that climate change can be embedded into the work that you do as a council. So we're going to start by the work that was done on compiling the evidence base. And by the evidence base, I mean the GHG inventory. So this is the account of all the emissions that the council estate is responsible for. And this is really the first step in the sort of path to um, achieving net zero. It's sort of working out where you currently are, understanding the largest sectors and those that can be targeted most easily before you form your policy. And then you can use this mechanism of accounting for emissions as a way to track and monitor progress towards your target. Um, so quickly, just so you know, in Tamworth, what we did is we compiled all the initial data sets. Then we hosted a workshop to define the scope of the inventory, and we'll go a little bit more into that in the next slide. We then performed some additional data collection and finalised the baseline, which is being presented today. Thanks. So when it comes to emissions, we talk about them in terms of scopes. Um, and I hope this isn't too much information, but it will become sort of um, useful later on when we're looking at the data. 
So scope one is that central arrow in the middle of the diagram you can see there on your screens, and these are called the direct emissions. So these are all the ones that um, the operations of the council are responsible for themselves, and they're owned and controlled. So the examples given on the slide are quite relevant, I think, for Tamworth. It's the buildings that you operate and sort of have ownership of, um, and the fleet that you do as well. Scope two is then called um, the indirect emissions, but they're the ones that are purchased or acquired. So that's essentially just electricity or heat and steam that might be purchased. It's separated out into a, a second scope. The one that you might have heard of and is more sort of hotly debated is scope three, because that's sort of everything else. Um, everything that's not included in either of those other scopes. And you see in the purple arrows, there's lots of different sources included in there. Um, and it gets complicated because that's when we start looking really into the value chain of the reporting organisation. So everything from commuting, so the way that the people you're employed are moving to come and work, or um, the things that you purchase or the services that you um, acquire. And that goes right down to sort of investments as well. Um, I've put just a note on the bottom of that slide just to remind me to remind you that, of course, the evidence base is just the start and um, you can have an action plan and you can impact um, emission sources that you haven't necessarily been able to account. So if there are scope three sources that you haven't been able to account for because the data is not available, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't then consider them in an action plan. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. So this is the result of the sort of scoping workshop that we had for Tamworth. So all of the um, boxes at the top of the slide, which are sort of called in scope, have been accounted for and will be presented in the data that I show you in a few, few slides time. So that includes all of the council owned buildings, so the gas and electricity emissions that result from that energy consumption, the council fleet, again, the fuel consumption from those vehicles. Um, the consumption from all the council-owned housing, um, although worth noting that that's just sort of the communal areas at the moment and not the full um, energy consumption of those buildings. Other council travel, so business travel and the sort of um, grey fleet, so those business mileage that people do in report. Um, electricity from street lighting, um, sort of direct contracts that the council are responsible for, so the green spaces and maintenance, um, and then also the waste emissions as well. At the bottom, we've got a box of out-of-scope sources, um, and these are the ones that sort of weren't applicable to Tamworth. So, um, for example, the leisure centre that is not owned and controlled by Tamworth. Um, we've got a box here which says to include, and that's because we made a decision um, after the sort of start of the project that these are sources that we'd like to include in the baseline for Tamworth. And so that's um, procurement of goods and services. And then the final box is recommendations, and these are the sources that we weren't able to account for, but have left recommendations for in our report of how you might move to account for those in the future. Um, so that's staff working from home, commuting, um, investments and pensions, and then any sort of non-operational lease buildings that you might want to bring into scope later on. Okay, next slide, please, thanks. Um, so just. Briefly, I thought it might be interesting to show you how the process works from sort of data collection. So I won't go into this in too much detail, but um, the basic principle of calculating a, an inventory is you take activity data. And so for energy consumption, that's the, the usage, so in kilowatt hours of gas or electricity, um, and then you apply an emission factor to it. Um, and as you can see, that was provided by a number of officers across the council. And so that sort of data collection exercise is really important in ensuring that these inventories can be um, compiled regularly. Thanks. And now the data. Um, so as you can see from the left, um, the largest emission sources are at the bottom and then they're sort of decreasing as you travel up. So this shows us that the emissions from the council housing were the largest accounted for, um, closely followed by the waste collection. The split on the bars show you um, the division between emissions arising from electricity consumption and gas consumption. So you'll see um, generally gas is responsible for a larger portion of the emissions. So heating is quite energy intensive and therefore um, accounts for a large portion of the emissions sort of 
pause for a moment for people to sort of look at that in a bit more detail. I suppose other things that I might point out um, for you are um, that the street lighting, well, that was the fourth biggest, but we know that there's potential for that to incre uh, decrease um, rather quickly because of the LED program. Um, the business travel, I think, comparatively to other council areas we work with, is quite low, the transport emissions. So that's like sort of a point of interest as well. Um, it's sort of the buildings and the waste collection that are really making up the, the bulk of the baseline. I imagine people might have questions, but we'll move on to the next slide, <laughs> return to it. Um, so something that, yeah, I want to draw out. You might have noticed in the table in the previous slide, the line at the bottom, which said procurement. Um, we didn't include it in the sort of sum total of the emissions because um, it's, we wanted to separate it out so we could show the impact. So you can see in this chart on the right-hand side here, the total emissions for Tamworth Council Estate with and with them without, um, sorry, the other way around, without and then with procurement emissions. And it actually accounts for 52% of the total emissions when included. So it's a really significant source. The way that this is accounted for at the moment is on a financial spend basis. So we have emission factors that basically say you get this kilogram of CO2e for each pound spent in this given activity. So it's separated into sort of like transport services or um, office services, office goods, that sort of... Um, it's done on SIC codes, if anyone knows what I mean by that, standard industry classification codes. Um, so it is split into sort of type of spend, but it does limit the accuracy of the emission calculation because, in short, it means that if you were to, for example, a procured service for, say, transport, um, you make all of those um, vehicles that are used for that service electric in the next year, your spend might actually go up, which using this method would show that the emissions have increased, whereas actually we would know that if you're suddenly deploying electric vehicles, that should come down. So I just want to make that disclaimer when we're talking about these emissions. But it's a good way to sort of benchmark and think initially um, about which contracts or services are most sort of carbon intensive. And so the, the tables, the table given there sort of gives the largest contracts and um, we can see that the sort of responsive repairs was 13% of those procurement emissions. And sort of going down that table there, that gets slightly less significant, but they're the major contracts. And then sort of finally, before I close up this part, this first part of our presentation, I want to think a little bit about moving forward. So that baseline was for the financial year 2019-20, so I should have said, but we also thought um, about what might happen to those emissions that we've accounted for in the following year, which obviously was an unprecedented year. Everyone's fed up of that word by now. Um, but we wanted to consider what might happen to those emissions before sort of decisive action was taken. So for some sources, we were able to look at the actual data. And so that's what's shown on the right hand side in the chart. And so you can see sort of fairly moderate increases for street lighting and waste collection, which is probably just a widening of that service. And then not much change um, in the green spaces or um, well, some mild decreases in the transport, but fairly constant. Um, but when we thought about the sources that we didn't account for, obviously working from home, that would have increased significantly for that 2020 year. Um, the housing emissions may also have, as people spent um, large portions of their time at home. Um, what else do we want to bring out here? Oh, yeah, just... And then on the decreases, um, there were some reduction in the sort of in the council fleet, and that's the move away from diesel, which is, yeah, obviously good to see. So then finally, before we stop to just get any questions, um, we have some short recommendations about what can be done with this evidence base. One of our recommendations is to try and include those currently missing sources. It'd be interesting to see with the sort of shift to more home working, does the reduction in the commuting emissions really outweigh the sort of increased working from home emissions? I think other councils have sort of seen mixed results on that, and it really does depend on the distances that were being commuted before and obviously including those working from home emissions in the core scope of the inventory. Um, thinking about um, better methodologies to look at the procurement emissions, 
it essentially means working with your suppliers to get a better you need their scope one and scope two emission estimates from themselves so that can be quite a long process um, but if you want to track emission decreases in that sector that's sort of what you need to move towards and away from that spend basis um, we spoke a little bit about the data collection and the effort that's needed across council to do that so embedding those data collection processes would be really important to make sure this can be done sort of semi-regularly and then also using this data to help people engage with the messages that you're trying to put out um, but I've put a little reminder there just on the data sometimes we see that people get slightly hung up on the data and they need to be able to track the data before action can happen and I think um, that is important and as obviously emissions consultants <laughs> we, we strongly believe that you do need data to track things and to um, inform decision making but also it is just an estimate in many cases especially like I said for the procurement and you shouldn't see that as a barrier before you start to think about action to take so yeah I think that was all from sort of part one um, happy to take any questions at this stage or move on to the next part if okay you thank you um, well I guess I guess the question is it, it, what's in the next part and should we yes. <laughs> yeah <of laughs> should course. we wait until the full presentation before we ask questions or um, is it is it a yeah it's sort of up to you so this this first part was all about you know the actual the sort of data and the evidence-based parts is whether people had questions on that and um, the next part will be thinking more about the results of the engagement we had with people through our project okay. and the recommendations for almost the next step okay so um on that basis i have a question um sure as you're the experts and will have engaged, I would guess, with, with possibly other local authorities, how, how do we initially compare with, with other local authorities? <laughs> yeah, yes, you can, Anna. I know, it, I know every, every local authority has a diff is completely different. Yeah. I didn't know if we could. Like you say, every authority is different, has different activities. Some have housing stock, some don't mm. have housing stock. Um, obviously, we've got waste collection, which is a shared service, and others will be running it themselves. So it is really difficult. Yeah. Um, but the, the key thing is, and the methodology, which Kirsten just went through, so that box with the boxes within it, looking at scopes one, two, and three, you know, we have included some um, of scope three in our methodology, some authorities don't go near it they just do scopes one and two um so 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 it is really difficult and, and like yes there will be um other baseline figures for other parts of staffordshire um but you you, you have to sort of take it with a pinch of salt because they will have done something very different Abs absolutely yeah I, I, I agree but i have to ask that question i think <laughs> uh other questions sarah Cheers, Michelle. Um, thank you very much, Councillor Thurgood. Um, so I completely hear what you were saying. I guess just as we kind of use this information going forward, particularly going out to members of the public, just kind of that caveat kind of going in that, yes, we understand we have the shared, but it is difficult to make those direct comparisons when methodologies are different. I guess it's more of a note than a question, but I was hoping you'd mention the shared waste. Thank you. Any comments, Anna? say that when we run through the recommendations there is quite a big section on the, the waste part of the emissions because um, it was so such a large component um, and it, it so, so it talks in detail about the shared waste service um, and some possible actions that we may want to consider jointly with with Litchfield. Thank you very much. Michelle. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just um, a couple of quick questions from me. Um, on going actually into the reports where you've got, I think it's on page four of the actual reports, the um, emissions in kind of terms for um, Tamborough Council 2019-20 and 2020-21, there's obviously the big long list, well, not that long list, actually, of admissions for 2019-2020. There is about one, two, three, four, five 
of them which have 20 20 21 data but there's a significant amount where it's just estimated considering the report wasn't finalized till august is there a reason why they weren't um been able to be kind of found so so for example things like what you were saying about estimating gas usage i'd assume that those would be kind of possible for 2020 21 so is there a reason why they weren't included thanks anna yes thank you um so the report was actually completed april april may this year but it's taken a while um, to put on the committee agenda just because of other committee workload. Um, so because the, the compilation of that data actually was towards the end of the financial year, we weren't able to get like the full set for some of them. If we did the exercise now, then I'd like to say that we would be able to. Michelle. That's absolutely understandable. In that case, can the report, because the report front page says it was completed in August 2020, and that's a sign-off date from the consultants. So if that's not correct, can that be adjusted accordingly? Because that's inaccurate information. Thank you. Happy with that, Anna. I think that's correct. Mm. The, the sign-off yeah. was August, but it was completed much earlier mm. in the year, and that's why the, the, the data doesn't quite fit with the sort of corporate year. Note added because it it isn't. <laughs> if you were reading that as I did over the weekends, I was like, well, hang on, that's why it's not there. If that's not if it's old date, not old data, but you know what I mean. If it's an older report, then that's different. So if that makes sense, yeah. But it should be amended on to say that it's it was completed by yourselves by then, so to speak. Okay, I that's think I think that's yeah. I think that's fair comment. I think. Yeah. I've got um, a second question, if that's okay. Go on. Would that be right? Um, again, in terms of things that were in scope slash out of scope, might be a question for Anna and Councillor Oates um, in terms of outdoor events and specifically fireworks are not mentioned at all in the report. Considering it's something that we procure, it might be under the procurement bit, but considering it's probably one of the biggest events that we do, which quite literally puts an awful lot of explosives of devices into the and carbon up into the atmosphere. The fact it's not mentioned at all in the report is there a reason why, and is it accounted somewhere else? Oh, thank you. I would probably comment that it's such a tiny amount, oh, to be honest. I, I wouldn't have thought it was a, a relevant percentage at all, but that's just a personal opinion. Um, I would refer to Anna and her experts. Um, just to kind of throw into that, but not necessarily for this report, but in a similar exercise that, that we've done elsewhere, we've looked at fireworks. Fireworks is a sort of, it's an obvious burning of stuff. Um, and generally, the, the amount of carbon associated with the fireworks themselves is actually very small. The bigger footprint is people traveling to and from the event, particularly driving to and from the event. Um, I think in this case, we don't have we didn't have that sort of information possibly looking at some of your public events particularly where you do have car travel involved and how you displace that could be a really interesting way forward again that's slightly outside the overall scope of the climate emergency declaration which was very much about council operations some of that stuff but yeah michelle thank you i mean that, that's absolutely incredible I, again i hadn't got a clue in terms of what percentage it would be but it, i suppose the fact that outdoor events isn't included in that things that we actually promote and operate it would be really nice as a further addition to see that included at some point and see where in the scope that would be thank you that was the end of my questions on that Paul. yeah thank you sure i mean mine's just a bit of a, a strategic comment really that we're looking at all these tactics of how we measure this stuff um, and it's very difficult to say you, me, do it differently, and it's all subjective. These these measures that we're doing it, but I think for the for the public, we we really need to have one sort of um, communication strategy to say, look, we are doing our best to reduce them. And you may argue whether how we question and measure stuff is good, bad, or indifferent. And you're right to pick up, you know, transport and there's an argumentation to say working from home may or may not reduce emissions to so having everybody in the office. It's all subjective. But the biggest thing that I, I think that a lot of this is um, concerning me is it's a race down very quickly. 
and a lot of the evidence base that we're doing isn't that good. So we just need to be cautious. That's all I would like to say. Thank, thanks, Paul. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say that, you know, we're at the start of this. We need this baseline to understand in which direction to go and perhaps where the easy wins are. There is no easy wins, actually, with, with this, but there's easier wins. Um, yeah. Sheree. Oh, so, sorry. Sorry. My uh, meeting etiquette isn't the best, <laughs> but there we go. I would just say um, I do agree, especially on the procurement admissions, which is why I tried to make a sort of a big deal about that. But I think otherwise, if you're looking at building consumption transport, I think the science is really good on those emission estimates, and they're they're pretty accurate. And so tracking energy consumption from buildings is something that can be really easy done, and the data would be very valuable in that in that sense. So for the scope one and two. Um, that data tracking will be very valuable, and I would say the evidence base is quite strong in that regard. The scope three, I would strongly agree. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sheree, I'll bring you in for this question, and then I'd like to move on to the um, the rest of the, the presentation. I understand that uh, some of our visitors need to need to need to go. Uh, on, they are on a time a time limit. So, uh, Sheree, crack on. I always crack on, Chair. <laughs> Um, it strikes me that the methodology for measuring emissions from procurement is, is really a sledgehammer to crack a nut. It's not very accurate, it's not very finely honed. So are the moves afoot to, to change that methodology? Is that under review, review at the moment? And that's just my first question. The second question, or comment actually, um, when we started our working from home policy, one might have thought that that would perhaps be more expensive emissions wise because instead of everybody congregating in one building they're all in separate buildings burning energy but actually that's probably not the case anymore because i think they'll all be sitting in their hats and gloves and keeping mm. the heating off um <laughs> but it would be interesting to see what that that figure comes out at but yeah the, the methodology for the procurement I'm, I'm particularly interested in thank you chair Hi, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And um, so I'm happy to share the sort of the actual factors that were used and how that was divided based on the spend categories. And um, that might be that might be helpful. I think moving to better methodologies there is it's quite a large engagement exercise. So it would be um, using the analysis that we've already done, identifying those top contracts and um, then engaging with those suppliers. Um, because you need better data and you need the data from them um, to do it centrally and sort of quickly like we did. Um, you need some other metrics, so that's why we use the financial spend. Um, there are sort of emerging engagement tools, I would say, that you could use to do that, reaching out and requesting that data from those organisations, but that's, that's sort of the next step. Um, we'll cover it in the next part of the presentation as well, but our recommendations around procurement sort of centre around the council making requirements of your contractors and that's another way that you can take back more of the control of um, the service they're providing without necessarily getting that accounting but you can put those sort of requirements in um, your procurement policy okay okay kirsten we'll, we'll we'll crack on with the next section if that's okay with you okay perfect i think i'm actually handing over to liz for this part Thanks. okay great thank you very much um so uh, I'm going to see which comes up because we've, I, I tweaked the order and um, there we go. Housing. I'm going to look at yours because yours is more. <laughs> That's right. I'll just put them around. You can look too. It's fine. Um, so be before I dive into some of this, um, this is about sort of different recommendations for different areas of council activity. Um, I'll caveat all of it by saying this is not the action plan of things you should do X, Y, Z in this year, this year, this year. That's the next stage of work that you committed to in your climate emergency declaration, as Anna mentioned. Um, I'll also pick up on a couple of things. So first of all, um, being cautious. Your offices are brilliant because it very much came across in the discussions with your offices and the engagement through the process that the council wants to make sure it does things in a way that is kind of pragmatic and sensible and occasionally a bit cautious 
rather than just running at things and going, oh, let's just throw money at it and see what happens. It's, it's like, no, hang on a sec, we need to be a bit more measured about how we do things. So that kind of filters through here as well. And taking time to do things where, where, where things need that time. And then the other thing to think about as we go through is um, things you can control and things you can influence. And so what happens in your buildings, you have a strong degree of control over. What happens, for example, in the shared waste contract, that becomes much more of that influencing role and partnership role and working with, with um, Litchfield and, and others. So with that said, um, the first uh, area to, I'm so glad this is here because really these are quite new glasses. Um, <laughs> The first area is housing. I've put this um, first because it is the, the, the biggest of the, the areas of impact. Um, and really, the, the, the thing here is to make a plan to make a plan. Um, there, are, there is discussion about having a 30-year business plan for housing, for your council housing stock. Um, and actually, this is now a thread of housing management. Um, so just as health and safety, fire safety, um, well-being, public health, all of those things are threads of housing management. Energy, energy efficiency, decarbonisation of building stock is going to be a thread of how you, how you do housing. Um, over a 30-year life cycle, all of your boilers are going to get changed to something different. Um, you're going to look at all of your windows, you're going to look at all your, the building fabric, you're going to look at how your, your buildings and your, your housing operates. The one thing I will say in here is the kind of counter to that of like, let's take some time and have the 30 year plan is that funding opportunities remain quite tactical. Um, and so having a sense of low hanging fruit, those sort of no regrets options um, that you can be ready with specific projects, specific buildings or estates to kind of come in and, and, and swoop in and, and, and make a difference is, is really important. The Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund is listed here. That's a, a big pot of funding that's, that's kind of committed, well, hopefully committed for several years from, from central government um, and, and we encourage you know, making as the best use of that as, as you possibly can. Uh, on to the next one please, which is the non-domestic council buildings. Thank you. Um, and again, this is really just fact finding a little bit more about um, the buildings you have, how they operate, what they do, and then looking at what you can do to kind of improve those. Now, we recognise that some of your buildings, this one in particular, have constraints about what you can do. Um, you're not going to be able to clad this in, you know, polystyrene insulation on the outside and much as you might want to. Maybe a dome, <laughs> maybe a, gla a glazing dome. <laughs> so, so there are limitations about what you can do, but there are also things you can do in terms of energy management and efficiency. Um, to bring that down and then also looking at the, the supply of, of, of electricity certainly into those buildings. Um, obviously there are intentions to, re to look at some parts of the building stock um, and figure out what you need as a council going forward and how well the existing buildings serve that purpose. Um, so any new build, any refurbishments, any acquisitions that you might undertake, actually building in carbon as a consideration at the, the earlier stages means that it's just just embedded in what you do, um, doesn't necessarily push up the cost of that work um, excessively, um, or you get the, the benefit of pushing up the capital cost in longer term revenue savings. Um, and again, funding opportunities tend to happen at very short notice, um, but, but take advantage of, of those as best you can. Um, the Public Sector Decarbonisation Scheme, which is a national scheme at the moment, has not only capital funding, but also kind of uh, revenue funding to support with consultants, advice, design, those sorts of things as well. Um, so, so that can be handy. Um, and then on to the one with the tiny handwriting. There you go. There's no <laughs> way I would have read that one. Um, this is around transport. And this is particularly thinking about um, business transport, business travel. Um, and the, the, the core objective is about not using or reducing the number of, of uh, journeys that happen using petrol and diesel vehicles and reducing the distance that those journeys, you know, uh, command. So actually, can you incentivize um, replacing short vehicle journeys with things like walking and cycling, e-bikes? Um, and potentially look at ways of incentivizing stuff. And, you know, we collect our 
45p a mile for, for driving a car, but we don't collect our 45p a mile for riding a bicycle. You know, are there ways of, of looking at that, particularly for short journeys, um, looking at um, activating the use of public transport more, whether that can be supported or subsidised in any way, cycle to work schemes. Um, but then for those longer journeys where you're still looking at vehicles, um, more EV charging points around the, the area, um, working with your neighbours as well to understand those travel patterns and traffic flows, um, because not everybody's starting and ending their journey in town, um, but they may be doing very similar journeys to main commute points, for example. Um, and then that helps to accelerate the transition of the council's fleet to electric vehicles where possible, recognising that some vehicles are going to take longer to do simply because the technology isn't there for, for example, big waste vehicles, which are prohibitively expensive and very difficult to do right now, but that will come later or alternative fuels will come later for those. Um, we've put an example here. As you read through the report, you'll see a bunch of other examples of, of how other councils have addressed some of these issues. They're there for sort of a little bit of inspiration, a bit of flavour as you go through. But that's all I want to say on those. So, Kirsten, I'm going to come back to you. Hello. Yes. So, con con to continue, um, we also looked at leisure and street lighting. Um, as we saw from the baseline, the emissions from street lighting are fairly small anyway, and we're aware of the the ongoing work that you're doing to replace those streetlights with LEDs. And so I think that's, that's a good plan. So we'll focus on the leisure part here. Um, obviously currently not included in the scope of the baseline because the leisure um, service isn't owned and operated um, by the council. But of course, if that were to become part of the council service in future years and that would come into your baseline and you'd have to sort of be prepared for the emissions increase that that would result in with some of the other councils we've worked for it's been quite a significant part of their baseline because of the heating demand on running something like a swimming pool. Um, so I think this recommendation is more actually about um, in the planning for such a facility should one um, be built. It's thinking about how that can be built so that it doesn't impact um, on the current baseline and can be built in the most efficient way possible. The example given here is um, a new leisure centre from Exeter Council um, and that was done in sort of passive house style which is essentially a fabric first approach to building which means that the building is insulated so that heating demand is relatively low and therefore the emissions are low. So I think we'll move on to waste. Um, so as you saw from the baseline this is obviously a significant sector for Tamworth, 31% of the carbon baseline excluding procurement um, and as we've already noted today this is currently a shared service with Litchfield and that's obviously presents its own complications with moving forward on a strategy. So the recommendations that we would give would obviously be to work jointly um, with the waste management board um, so when the contract comes up for renewal there's some things to think about. Um, one is the transport side of it what vehicles might be um, ready to replace, um, so thinking about the ultra low emission vehicles um, and making sure that any future depot is has got the um, facilities to charge those vehicles and make those operational. Thinking about the depot itself, it was noted that um, the emissions might be quite high because of the location of that depot in Litchfield and the, therefore the distances that the refuse vehicles need to travel in order to do their collection services. And so thinking about the location of that depot and if there's anywhere where it could be placed that makes it more efficient for the joint service could be one thing. Thinking about the waste itself, looking further at the, the waste hierarchy, so the reduce, reuse, recycle, um, and thinking about additional ways to introduce recycling there. So anaerobic digestion and looking at food waste, which as I, currently, as I understand isn't currently um, recyclable in Tamworth. Okay, next slide, please. Our next favourite procurement. Um, so we note with something like procurement um, that Tamworth's buying power on its own um, perhaps isn't the most significant and there might be barriers there in terms of the budget of the contracts that you're letting to put extra requirements on suppliers. So one thing that we recommended would be to think about working with your neighbouring councils to increase um, that purchasing power. 
There's also a national framework that you could look at, um, the National Social Value Task Force framework. Um, and that gives you a way to embed that in your procurement strategy. So you ask of suppliers to um, make suggestions when they bid on work for the council of how they will um, sort of embed in their work that they're delivering um, elements of social value, which has a strong sort of climate change theme through it. And then otherwise it would be yeah, directly engaging with your suppliers, understanding their emissions and sort of supporting them to identify ways um, of reducing their own emissions and then obviously um, making sure that you're engaging with the procurement teams early on in that process so that they understand what is required in line with the net zero strategy that you that you come up with. Thank you, next slide. This one's coming back to me. Um, <laughs> I think there's just a couple more and then, then if, if that's all right with you, Chair, we'll open up for, for questions. Um, so really just a couple here on, we were also asked to look at the kind of cross-cutting things that you could do as, a, as an organisation to really embed thinking about carbon reduction and climate change into how you do business. Um, this, this, is, this was quite an, an unusual request to get at this stage of a project, because often councils will say, can you do the numbers and then figure out what we should do? Oh, and then we'll figure out how to kind of embed it and report on it actually brought that forward and you said how can we be an organization that wants to do this and then that will feed through into the activities that we choose to undertake from the action plan so that, that was a really kind of a nice way to do things an unusual way to do things so credit credit to you for that one um, basically we we had a look through um, the different ways of doing business we spoke with with officers we spoke with a number of councillors as well and just identified some some areas where there are process improvements or system improvements or opportunities to really build this into, into the culture and to, to how you operate. Um, there's a lot listed here. There's, there's more in the report. Um, if we go on to the next slide, please. I've picked up a couple, um, a handful of things that just feel like really, you know, nice opportunities that could make a good difference um, to start with. Obviously, the, there's the kind of strategic documents that guide what you do, um, such as the corporate plan and then the ways that you measure progress against those, like the performance management framework, um, and trying to embed this activity into that, just make sure that it gets that kind of consistency um, of, of, of interest. I think we heard from, from, from officers that sometimes if something's not defined as a project, it doesn't necessarily get the kind of level of, of performance management requirements and so forth, and doesn't fit the flow. And do you call climate carbon reduction a project or is it too big? Is it, yeah, it's a series of projects under a programme. It's that sort of thinking just to make sure it's really built into to how, you, how, you, how you think at a strategic level. Um, decision making, um, we've heard that um, reports to committees and cabinet have um, consideration of sustainability, uh, but th that's perhaps not really as rich as it could be. It's more of a, perhaps a sort of, we've considered sustainability and that there's not always that kind of pushback from the people receiving those reports to say, well, what does that mean? How does that work? Why is that the way it is? So I think kind of trying to look at ways to, bullet point number three, build everybody's carbon literacy to be able to have those conversations. Um, and then also to make sure that that reporting and decision making is really kind of embracing this issue, this issue um, in a meaningful way would, would be helpful. I've put here some images from um, a tool that Cornwall Council uses, um, which is broadly based on a concept called donut economics, which some of you may, may be familiar with. Um, but it's a set of um, considerations for how you make decisions um, to look at, if we do something, will the impact on that little segment of the pie be positive, negative, or about the same? Um, it doesn't necessarily tell you what you should choose, it just makes you think out loud and it gives the transparency of thinking and decision making. Because sometimes you'll, for very good reasons, say actually a social program that addresses, you know, people's very real concerns about cost of living crisis, actually it's gonna take priority over a carbon reduction project which we could hold off for a year without really kind of, you know, we'll be okay. So it brings those decisions much more out into the open. Um, 
da, 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 carbon literacy throughout the organisation. I know across Staffordshire there have been some um, activities with, um, certainly with, with sort of senior uh, leaders within um, various councils to build carbon literacy. I think trying to build that across the organisation generally would be great. Um, money is always a thing. First barrier to any of this is always money. Actually having a funding strategy that thinks about carbon reduction in the long run and says, okay, what is our investment strategy for this? And you can build that from the action plan that you'll be working on next to say, well, okay, here's what we need across our 30-year business plan for housing. Here's what we need across our non-domestic buildings. Here's what needs to happen within the waste budget to make that new contract operable. Underpinning that, as always, there's, there, are, there are forms and bits of paper um, and actually some changes that were suggested to some of the tools that you use around capital appraisal and revenue budget decision making, there are some changes that potentially could go in there that would really just help to just kind of build this into to the process. Um, and then the last bit, it's been mentioned already in terms of procurement um, and some of those shared contracts, is working in partnership. Um, and we talk a lot about Staffordshire and the other neighbouring local authorities, but also reaching more broadly out across the West Midlands, um, even looking the other way to the East Midlands, dare I say it, um, but also leveraging the, the, the passion and enthusiasm of some of your community organisations, green groups, um, local residents, the health sector, the voluntary sector, to try and kind of come together around some of these issues. And it may be that, you know, if the council on its own lacks the purchasing power on something, the council combined with other agencies or other service providers can also build up that, that grounds that ground soil and that scale of activity. I think that's it from me. Kirsten? Thank you. Yeah, well, this was just going to be my conclusion slide, but actually listening to you on that last slide, I think I would be definitely repeating <laughs> a lot of things here. Um, I suppose that's what conclusions are. But um, I think just to reiterate those points then, um, declared the climate emergency, you have your target. Um, we recommend, obviously, a carbon emission reduction first policy, avoiding um, sort of the requirement for substantial offsetting come that target year. Um, and then, yeah, I don't want to repeat all those things again, but these are our, our summary of the recommendations. So creating that strategy, building the knowledge base across the council and the local area, um, getting those systems in place to support you in this so that with the decision making and the procurement policy. And then lastly, yeah, thinking really about that joint working and the opportunities that could present. So I think that's everything we have for the presentation. Thank, questions. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, so I think just initially we'll take some questions on, on, on that last section. I just have one comment to make first. And it was sort of on that last slide with regard to the um, em embedding the decision making process. I'm, I think often we we just look at sort of two factors if we're, if we're making a, a procurement and that might be um, does it fit the requirements and two, how much is it? And I think yeah, we need to be adding a third and, and, and seeing that, that third climate change uh, or climate um, aspect as, a, as like a given, a given sort of uh, aspect. So just to comment on that. Questions, Cherie? Thank you. That's a really interesting presentation, so thank you all. My question's for the Leader of the Council. Waste is a really big issue. I think the council in the past has taken the view that, um, that that waste disposal has to be cost neutral or we ought to make money out of it. We can't. And we've actually got a responsibility to deal with some of the waste that we're not currently dealing with. We used to have a food collection service and we don't anymore. And I think an awful lot of people out there feel that it's criminal that we put waste food into landfill. And I think we, ha as a council, we have to accept that there are some things that we ought to do because it's the right thing to do, and it might cost us money, or it might cost our residents money. And I think a lot of people will agree that if it does cost money, then so be it. That's that's something that we've got to do to preserve the planet. Um, speaking as a as a trustee of a small charity or in a community cafe, you know, cafes waste food. They can't help it because not everybody eats everything that's on their plate. So we need to 
And it would really, you know, gladden our hearts if we knew that the waste food that was generated from the cafe was being properly disposed of in a hopefully carbon neutral way. So what are we going to do about food waste? Jeremy. I uh, completely agree with your comments. Uh, the, the, only, the only correction is uh, it doesn't go to landfill in Staffordshire. There's only a very small amount that does because it goes to the waste of energy plant. Uh, but that doesn't negate your, your point. Um, I'm tempted to go on a big, long rant about waste collections. Uh, but, but, but I've just been told don't. Um, in, in, the, in the 1950s and 60s, we, we picked up bins from outside everyone's houses. It's now the year 2022, and those bins have now got wheels on and come in all colours of the rainbow. But we're still picking up bins from outside everybody's house and still doing pretty much the same thing with it. Different colours, different receptacles. Some gets shipped around the world, some gets incinerated. We need, not just Tamworth, we need a proper look at how we deal with waste because I don't think we've progressed for years. Um, the recycling system came in in 2003, 4 in Tamworth. Uh, and we can sit here and go, oh, it's because we want to be green. Let's face it, we did that because the government told us to and the government gets, gave us some cash to. And since then, our waste collection and recycling collection has been about chasing government figures and making sure we've got the money. It's, we don't recycle for green reasons. We recycle because it chases the money and it ticks boxes. So, so that, that's my rant. Um, so we do need a fundamental review. In terms of uh, the, the food waste collections, uh, the government are reviewing their targets again, uh, and that's, we're expecting that to come down the line in the next sort of 18 months as to clarity as to what they're demanding. Uh, there was a suggestion that that should be a, a weekly collection, uh, but at the minute it's, a, it's only suggestions. Um, we've just re-entered um, re an agreement with our waste collections, so there's a couple of years before we review that, but there is flexibility because of the government's changes in, in or proposed changes. Uh, in waste collection. So I can't give you the detail today. What I can do is, is try and assure you that I'm passionate about this subject as well because, like I said, I can't see the difference in the last 70 years in, in, in the system uh, and, and how we deal with waste. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm committed to do something differently and take every opportunity we can, but completely agree with your point uh, on, on food waste and, and all, all other waste. You know, if, we, if we're collecting it in the back of a lorry and shipping it to wherever in the world, how is that possibly saving the planet? So there's a lot of work to do. In terms of the uh, papers we've got in front of us, there's, um, as, as you see, 31% uh, is, is waste collections. And is it Kirsty or Kirsty? Yeah. Um, uh, as already suggested, you know, the depot's in Litchfield. So actually, what can we do short term in our current situation to, to, to mitigate our impact whilst we deal with with the bigger questions, which are the points you raised, Shuri. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, any other questions or comments? A number. Okay, so we'll have to rush through if they're if they're uh, if they're ones for our our visitors, as they do need to leave in in five minutes. So, Sarah. Yeah, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, great. What you've started. Brilliant. I mean, it's a bit coincidental today. I was sat with Stefan, the Chief Executive Officer, uh, and as Chair of Audit and Governance, was looking at the strategy of auditing all our assets and including that in that very audit, because it is critical. I think we've all got to be grown up, really, that this is a 25 to 30 percent up cost to start with. That's a fact. It's not going to be any different. Whether the public and us can swallow that is another matter. Um, you're right that this is a culture change, a big culture change, and that's going to be won by the stick and the carrot. And in the short term, the race to electric is going to be painful. I do a lot of work with the automotive sector, and electric cars are not the answer. They, they throw it away after five years. Anyway, thanks for that. Thank, thanks, Paul. Uh, Liz. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Just, just to respond on that, um, one of, I hope in the report there's um, lots of discussion about the, what we call the co-benefits of action to reduce carbon emissions, um, and particularly within the housing sector and the council, social housing sector, 
Um, whilst the, the carbon footprint baseline is all about your communal areas and shared spaces and communal lighting, it would be remiss of you as, as landlords not to actually be supporting your residents with um, improving energy efficiency, keeping warm, keeping their fuel bills down. And the, the side effect of that is you're also reducing carbon emissions. Oh, and you're also helping their health and well-being and creating a bit more pride in where people live and all of those sorts of things. So I think people will potentially buckle at, you know, we're going to put your council tax up to do this, you know, to do something. They'll go, oh, well, why are you doing that? That's not important. But actually, we want to invest in improving the quality and, and energy efficiency of your homes. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Michelle. Thank you very much. Um, no, I mean, just coming back on that kind of comment you've just made there, I think that is a massive risk from housing, that potentially you are in a, dare I say, you're creating a two-tier society within our own housing stock, because when you put in ground source or air source heat pumps, assuming there isn't some sort of, should we say, carbon-friendly gas alternative that comes out, those residents, one would assume, would get significantly reduced bills because you're getting much better efficiencies. You're looking WPD as our kind of um, energy distributor, estimates £744 for the cost of running an air or gas source heat pump. Well, that's massively different to what somebody with a gas boiler is paying. So actually, as an authority, when we're installing new boilers over the years, or equivalent boilers, Actually, that means that some residents are going to be paying significantly less. And if you're in council accommodation, the likelihood is you are the poorest in society. One would assume, not in all cases, but the vast majority will be. And that's a disparity, potentially, longer term, that we need to start thinking about as well. Um, Sorry, Michelle, I just heard you two uh, ask yeah, a question of our, that's our visitors. That, that, but I think that's oh, it's good to see. That's why it's right now, because it is it's something we need to kind of have an answer for. But I've got to be naughty, and I'm really sorry. The joys of sending out a presentation is you get to see the rest of the slide pack, and it actually says the very last slide, slide 27, um, which kind of um, hidden slides in case of needing pathway projections for Tamworth, where you've got the, um, the kind of the graph that shows 2050 to 2030. Would you mind terribly explaining it? Because I'm going to go away and wonder what it, what it means. Thank you. <laughs> Question. Yeah, that was me being over-prepared with slides in case of questions, and I did forget about that. But um, yeah, so that's, you might have heard of the term, the sort of science-based target initiatives. And so that, that slide is from the Tyndall Centre, which was a project by Manchester University and the Tyndall Centre. Um, and they made pathways for each local authority area. So the one there was for Tamworth. And the reason why I had that was I wondered if someone might ask a question on sort of the speed of which this is required and how that looks sort of progressing to 2050. And the main point that I would make around that slide is just, as you can see in the curve, this isn't a linear, um, yeah, it's not linear, that, that decrease. Um, and that's because of the concept of sort of cumulative emissions in the atmosphere. So if you kept your baseline constant all the way up to 2049, let's say, and then you managed to reduce everything in that last year, um, that wouldn't be in, in line with a science-based target because the cumulative emissions would sort of result in us going over that tipping point as a, an Earth, <laughs> as the UK. Um, so that was the point that I was going to make on that slide. Um, anyways. Okay. Okay. Um, I know, I know you guys are, uh, need, to, need to run off, so I'll say thank you very much on behalf of the, the committee for your presentation um, and, and the work you're doing, and we'll, we'll continue on with, with, with Anna. Um, but th thank you so much for, for attending. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just wait a second while... Uh, Thank you.
<coughs> Thanks, Sarah. Apologies. Uh, it's a quick question to Councillor Oates. Good evening. Um, and I really appreciated your response when you were talking about waste and you know, the care that you have for the entire issue. Um, in the report, it mentions um, green groups in the voluntary sector. I was just wondering whether the group Tamworth Climate Action had been in touch with you or members of the council at all with some of the suggestions that they have, particularly regarding cycling and incentivising cycling around Tamworth. Thank you. Jeremy? Anna's first to answer. Oh, OK. Yeah. Anna? Only to say yes, I have. They have been in touch with me. Um, um, over the summer, I did quite a big signposting job for them. No pun intended there, actually, but, um, you know, they had various issues that they wanted to raise, not necessarily with us, actually. Some were, some were with us, with um, Sarah McGrandall's team, with tree planting and grass cutting, etc. But they also had cycling issues, and they, they were struggling to get hold of the right person in the right place at the county council. So I did the job for them and found them the contacts to give them that sort of in where, where they needed it. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sarah. Sure. It's a really very quick, practical question. Street lighting was mentioned in the report. I thought that was the county, not us. Jeremy? Yeah, not all of it. We do have some that's ours. So if you look at some of the HRA estates, some of that will be our lighting. If you look at parts of the castle grounds, some of that will be ours. Uh, so, so whilst it's nowhere near the size of the county councils, we do still have... Uh, our own bits. Uh, we are in a joint procurement and servicing contract with the county council's contract, if you want a better phrase. Uh, so our lights are being changed in the same program as the county council ones. So, so you won't notice the difference. But yeah, there are some that are there are ours. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Because I was going to say when I was on the county council, they'd started the process of changing to more any energy efficient lighting. So I'm glad to hear that we're part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions and comments at, at the moment? Michelle. Thank you. Um, yeah, two more questions from me. One is in terms of, has there been any work done or estimated in terms of cost estimates yet um, from kind of the measures that are included within here as recommendations or things that you could potentially consider? And also what's next in terms of next steps? So what, what do we see when? I don't know, Councillor Oates, I've asked you a question on this tomorrow night, so <laughs> but I thought I'll ask it now as well. Thank um, you. Do you have something else? Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll very briefly cover some of, some of that. Uh, if you look down the, 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 the list of recommendations on page, uh, I've lost the page, 61 of the report, of, is it page 54 of the actual document? Anyway, there's a list of recommendations. Um, some of those we are already implementing through the Leaders Board or the Sustainability Board. Uh, so what we'll do in terms of the next stage, uh, when we start putting the action plan together, is we'll pull out the bits we're already working on and we'll have some better information on those. And then the other stuff we aren't working on yet, that's the question you just asked in terms of costing and, and, and resourcing. Um, I think the, the key thing that jumps out uh, to me from this document is the requirement for a funding strategy and a project pipeline. Uh, and I think the, the, the reason they're, they're important is if we can jump when there's, a, there's an offer of cash and make the most of it. Uh, and I think Councillor Turner's already alluded to this, this isn't going to be cheap. The thing that binds our hands, and I think we said this in 2019 when, when we discussed the, the climate change emergency, the thing that binds our hands is the funding. We are a small local authority with a finite amount of cash. Uh, and, and the reason the deadline is, is 2050 uh, for the government is because they will set that and their funding pattern will reflect that, fund, uh, will reflect that timeline. Um, so so we, can, we can look to, uh, at costings and resourcing what we've got. Uh, you already alluded to the uh, parity in uh, council housing uh, heating, and yes, I did make a note. Uh, and my note actually reads, uh, confirming a 30-year business plan that we deliver parity. Um, and it's, it's the, those little actions there is how we'll build up the proper answer to, to the question you're asking. I suspect I won't be able to answer that properly until we've got that next stage completed in, in terms of the action plan. Anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, thank you. I mean, the action plan, really, that's where it gets a bit spicy, I suppose, because, you know, we've got a lot of 
potential areas to look at across the authority. Some obviously contribute quite significantly to our emissions and some don't. Um, but we will have to look at our finances and, and really fl flip those around so that we support and prioritise delivering a net zero carbon authority over the, the you know, required timescale. So there's, no, we haven't put costs against what's coming because we've kind of got to identify that first. Um, and there's going to be a lot of quite challenging discussions around the action plan. So, for example, you know, we might have to make a decision, spend £100,000 one year um, to deliver a 20% reduction in emissions versus a million pounds to deliver 1%. You know, we've, we're going to have those balancing acts um, and then we're going to have to make those very challenging decisions. Um, so, uh, I think like Jeremy said, yes, some, some work is already, you know, ongoing, if you like, um, but there's a lot that needs to be achieved. Jeremy. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to come back in. I think the, the key to this, and it, it's within the report, is what what can we afford and when? What impact does that have, as, as Anne has just explained? Uh, but also keeping the focus on the profiling. And the thing that comes out of the report very clearly is offsetting comes after getting your own house in order. So, so we, you know, there's a lot of people who'd be who'd be desperate to run out and plant a load of trees and go. There you go, we're done. Well, if we're not solving the problem in the first place, those trees are redundant. Mm. And it sounds like I'm being flippant. I'm trying to <coughs> give real life examples. So, so the key thing is the profiling and making sure we we reduce our contribution before yeah. we start worrying about uh, uh, about offsetting. Anna. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. It is. It's an absolute last resort when you, you, you know, can we get to no carbon authority? Um, that's a really big question mark. And so you offset what you, what you can't achieve really has to be last. We are slightly constrained in Tamworth. We are incredibly urban. Um, now, I sit on a, a senior sustainability officers group, which um, supports the Staffordshire Sustainability Board. Um, and we are looking sort of pan Staffordshire at some of these issues. So actually, if we did need to offset, could one of our neighbouring authorities do that for us? Um, so I think there will be perhaps potentially some sort of back scratching. We can help an authority and they can reciprocate in a different way um, to actually um, allow us to achieve that. At this point, offsetting actually in on the size that it might need to be I don't think would be achieved within Tamworth. Um, I know the county council have already, um, that they, they are some way down, they've got quite a big sort of climate change team working on this already, and uh, they had um, some sort of figure like they need to plant 20 million trees, for example, to where they think their offsetting might get them to. And I think over the course of a year, managed to plant something like 1,000. So they already feel the pressure that they're behind their own targets to, to offset. So, you know... Um, yeah, it very much is a, a last resort and actually will be a very challenging um, option for us. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Anna. Other questions or comments? Anybody? No? Okay. Um, I, think, I think it's a fantastic report and a fantastic sort of... Um, first hit at what is such a... A challenge to to this authority um we clearly need that first sort of understand our baseline before we can formulate an action plan um i think that's been some some particular highlights and i think other people have, have have mentioned those already um and and i think we await the the action plan i mean what's the time scale on on the next stage Anna, thank you. Um, so obviously, we need to get this baseline through various mm. committees. That's the that's the first thing to do, um, and then to tender competitively for consultancy to come in and provide that support okay. to me to be able to do to be able to do the work. Um, I don't know how long it will take. It, it's going to depend on how complex the issue is for Sorry. us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and how easy we get on with it and. Um, getting everyone around the table and talking coherently. So I can't really give a time scale. Okay. 
I think last year, when I took the report through ISAG and Cabinet, so last February, setting up the, this project in the, in the two steps um, that we've got, I think I said it would report back sort of the year 23, 24. So not this year. Yeah. 20, what are we in, 22, 23? So, so the next yeah. one. So I, that's what I was thinking, but because actually it's taken a while to get to this committee, things are a little bit delayed, so it could even be the following year. Uh, you know, I don't want to set expectations, yeah. but it is a big piece of work um, to, to do it properly and to, to do it justice, I think. So, yeah, like the whole programme of work, it's not something really to be rushed at. Thanks, thanks, Anna. Michelle. Thanks, Chair. So, Anna, just a really, sorry, really quick one just on that. I suppose, I mean, if you're looking at that sort of time scale until potentially an action plan is put together, is the things that we can do here and now, like, for example, procurement, et cetera, and I can see kind of, <laughs> sorry, it's nodded immediately then, and it looks like potentially we can, but I suppose it's just setting out that expectation, because even though there is, say, and I'm going off on a little bit of a mini rant here, even though in Tamworth we're not necessarily seeing major effects just yet of climate change, I was only listening to BBC World Service yesterday, where they were saying that in Syria, you've got people dying, dying of um, col is it cholera? Um, because water's not moving fast enough. You've got people in Pakistan with dengue fever and malaria. And they were saying 7,000 children had died in the last week. That's now. So us sitting here talking 2024, 20, 23, 24 and 5 is a good enough. <laughs> we need something sooner. And I know what they said about don't rush things, but there's certain things we can do now. And the big stuff we build up to, and I think it's just, that's me as an individual, one person sitting in Tamworth, saying actually, globally, people are dying right this second. We need to start doing something as does everyone else. And I know you can't solve the world problems, but actually the pressure back to say, please do what you can when you can. And ultimately this council did say 2030, if it's financially viable. If we're not going to get a plan together until 2024, that only leaves us six years which is an awful lot to do on that. So that's just my... Thank, thank, thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I mean, we, we have to do what is achievable. Um, and I'm sure Jeremy's going to make some comments on maybe what could be achievable. I, I weren't sure if you'd seen me. Um, I think uh, the, the comments you made earlier, actually, Mr Chairman, uh, about procurement and stuff, there are things within this report that are entirely in-house and entirely our control. Uh, and I think one of the, of the comments is uh, uh, the, the word embedding is used a lot. Uh, so there are things we can start to do that actually we don't need a plan for. Mm. You know, uh, When we go through, we've got future high street fund updates uh, shortly. Mm. When we go through large project, projects like that, when we go through, um, and I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, but when we go through uh, design and rationalisation for different parts of those projects, Actually, there's nothing stopping us taking on the climate change agenda now in terms of those decisions. When we go through the budget process, uh, it was on one of the slides uh, about consideration of, of this. So, so there's a lot of stuff that, whilst it might not sound exciting, will contribute that we can do without having a plan. You know, we, we've got the recommendation there. We can go straight in there and do it. So, so that will be an exercise we need to do as ourselves. You know, uh, in terms of the action plan, uh, as, as Anna alluded to there, you know, when it comes to the big stuff, yes, we are going to have to do properly and we are going to have to plan for it and, and do that pipeline of projects, do that resourcing exercise. Uh, but in terms of the decisions we're making now or over the next couple of couple of months, then there's no reason why we can't adopt some of those recommendations and get moving on them immediately. Yeah, um, so yeah, I hope that reassures people. But yeah, we can. there's a lot of stuff we can just crack yeah. on with. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Jeremy. Paul. Yeah, I'd just like to concur with... Uh, that really, that it's now a culture thing, that it's there in our brains anyway. So when we're all making decisions privately on a business sense for the council, we've got to think about that. And, and you're right, you know, we've got a massive future high street fund coming down the line. We've got lots of stuff that we can do daily. Walk to the shops. So it is in our, in our psyche now. The culture is changing. And I think we're all aware, you know, for the kids and the grandkids, we've got to do something. Thanks, Paul. Any other questions or, or comments? 
I mean, I, I would say that uh, we, we have two recommendations that are one that the baseline assessment is endorsed, which we, we, we've, we've seen that, and that an action plan is prepared, um, which are the the items in the in the report. I mean, I I, I would be. I, th I think based on the conversation that we've just had, in that um, that there could be certain things that are are implemented quickly or um, as a matter of course, then I'm wondering whether we could make that a third recommendation to to let's say encourage uh, encourage that. Um, I don't know what other committee members think. Or whether it is whether that is covered within the report, Sheree. Yeah, thanks for your suggestion. Um, I, I'm ambivalent on on a third um, recommendation, but I would like to see a timescale on recommendation two. Okay, I think we've heard that it's difficult to give a, a complete. We've got a, a target, but perhaps difficult to put a, a finite date on that. Um, Jeremy or Anna, would I, you? I can see that, that 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 might be difficult, but I think if we don't put timescales on things, then there is a danger that they slip, just because people have other deadlines that they're trying to work to for other projects. So I, I, I really do think yeah. we need, even if it's an indicative time scale, we need yeah. something. Okay. I'll bring Jeremy and Anna in, in a second, and I'll take your question afterwards, Michelle. Uh, we were just, I was just trying to pin Hannah down on something more precise than 23, 24. Yeah. Um, in terms of giving a definite time right now, we, we would struggle. Uh, there's... Uh, the tender's got to be written, it's got to go out, it's then got to be, uh, you know, awarded, uh, and then the consultant's got to do the, the piece of work. Uh, so as we sit here, it would be difficult to give a, a, a solid timeline. Uh, I've asked Anna to come back and give us more information, uh, but if you, if you if, I mean, it's up to you what, what you guys recommend or propose, but, uh, um, yeah, we might have an answer by by the cabinet meeting when you raise it. Uh, I don't know without further conversations. Okay. Um, would, do you think you would have a, an answer by the cabinet meeting at which it, this, these recommendations would go through? Because that really sort of gives us, I, I, I don't really want to, uh, to take your, uh, your word that it will be that we can, or whether we do need to make a formal recommendation. Um, Jeremy. In response to your direct question at the end, <laughs> uh, if you would like to make a formal recommendation or not, that mm. is entirely at the whim of the mm. committee. Yeah. Uh, and, and actually, this conversation we're probably having now is really up to you guys to, to decide if you want to give us a timeline or, or give us a, a specific data or, or not. And that's it. That's up to, to, to you mm, guys okay. entirely. Um, if you were to include that as a recommendation or alter, uh, alter number two, then we would have to respond to it at the cabinet meeting because that's what we do at cabinet. We respond to the recommendations, feedback and accept or, or not. So, so it's entirely down to, to you guys and we'd have to respond at the next cabinet meeting anyway if you did uh, choose, choose to include that as a recommendation. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I just want to create something that's realistic and achievable. Um, I'm going to ask Cherie, if she was going to make a recommendation for a timeline, what would you say? That's an impossible question to answer, Chair, because I'm not the officer who's having to do the work. I think what we're what we're asking for is for the officers to tell us what's a reasonable um, timeline to look at. I appreciate that there are lots of variables, yeah. and you know, but 
if, if, for example, by the end of 2024, we hadn't hmm. got anything, we might be saying, well, what's been going on for the last couple of years? So, yeah, just just some indicative timescale is all really that we're asking for. We're not going to, um, you know, hold your feet to the fire and, um, and say, well, you haven't done it yet, so you're in trouble. <laughs> Based on that, I would recommend that an action plan is prepared before the end of 2024. And I think that might be quite reasonable. Um, and I would welcome Anna or Jeremy's view on that before I move on to other people. As I said, Mr Chairman, um, it would be inappropriate me, for me to try and change your your recommendation on the field of the committee, uh, but we should respond to it at, at the appropriate okay. time. Uh, I don't know what Anna's feelings are on that. I appreciate that uh, we're already running behind on where we anticipated to be with this. Uh, and if we take out our, our year of inaction while we're fighting the pandemic, we're a bit further behind than where we should, where we wanted to be in 2019. Uh, so, so I appreciate we're, we're, we're playing catch up already. Um, so I, I, I could only respond to, to whatever the committee decides at, at, at this Thank you. meeting. I would, I'm going to move that we say an action plan is prepared before the end of 2024 uh, and I'd welcome a seconder or any other comments from uh, Cherie. I'm happy to second that, Chair. I appreciate the difficulties officers yeah. have, but uh, by the same token, we declared this to be a climate emergency for which urgent action was required back in 2019. And I appreciate the pandemic has caused a huge, huge number of problems for everybody. But um, I think we, we owe it to the people of Tamworth to, to show that we mean I th business. I think as a target, I think we should be ambitious. And as Cherie said, I don't think... Um, I don't think anybody's going to. Uh, well, it's a scrutiny. It's a scrutiny committee recommendation. So I'm going to move that. It's been seconded. Um, I'm going to. You want to make a comment, Richard? I think th there's several people who want to make comments. Okay. Uh, can you please clarify uh, by 2024? Are you meaning the end of municipal year 23/24 or December 2024? December 2024. Thank you for the clarification, Michelle. Thanks. I'm just going to say another two years. <laughs> Maybe I know I get that it's difficult, but this was something I know Councillor Ford, you really pushed for the climate change emergency to be declared in 2019, as Councillor Peoples just said. It's bad enough that we're, I know Mr. COVID's happened and not necessarily the whole team were in place from right from the beginning, but another two years to get any sort of action plan, to me that just seems wrong. <laughs> I get th there's got to be something we can do sooner than that. That would be my personal view. And my second point was what I was originally going to say was in terms of the third kind of recommendation, I'd happily move the fact there's a recommendation to say that we actually have some sort of report that says what does Town Borough Council have in its control here and now, as Council Oates alluded to, what we can do and much, much sooner. So within the next kind of few months, actually see something we can do i.e procurement and bits and pieces that we can start and as councillor turner said in terms of that challenge actually getting it into sight and so actually what's our pr and comms team doing in terms of promoting when you're coming to bonfire night in a few weeks time you walk down you don't drive down as an example so stuff we can do here and now versus the longer term big stuff which we know might take four or five years to do because it's so big or it's bidding for work or getting people used to it, etc. So I think there's a difference. Thank, thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I would suggest that most people will will walk to to Bonfire now that, that, that have... That in the wet, yeah. Um, Paul? Yeah, just a mm -hmm. comment, really. Um, obviously, this is such a massive project for anybody to pick up with. Uh, and I, I would strongly recommend that we divide it into a small-term, medium-term and long-term goals and aims and aspirations particularly the criteria on the small you know the short term should i say is what can tbc do today uh, and and come back with a to the next meeting 
with that sort of plan of you know your short term, your medium term, your long term, prioritise them, put some sort of you know timeline against them, and and I think that that will break it down and give us a lot more focus on can we achieve the short term? What do we need to do for the medium term? And so the long term, can we put the funding in place and the strategy and the mission statement to put it all together as a strategic plan? I think that's the action plan, Paul. There you go. I would say that was that was the action plan. So. Andy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think that I think we've, we've got to watch ourselves. I've, I've, I've stayed quiet, uh, particularly listening to the discussion. Uh, we've got to watch ourselves. We were uh, commended by the uh, by the consultants for being pragmatic and realistic and looking at the problem and breaking it down properly. And I think now we've come to a situation where we're trying to race and push people for an action plan of something that we don't really quite know what the problems are yet. So I think we need to give the officers some time to put a proper action plan together, be pra pragmatic and realistic, and then feedback when we've when we've done that in 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 light of what we've been told by the consultants. I think I think that's I think that is fair. Uh, however, if we say by the end of 2024, that is over two years, and as an ambition, I think I think that's I think that's reasonable myself. Should Chair, a, a, a motion's been proposed and seconded. Uh, can I ask that the vote's now put, please? Absolutely, you can. I just want, I just want to involve everybody else in that uh, in that process. We've got two recommendations at the moment. We'll just take this this um, the the action plan is prepared. And just take that separately for the for the moment. So we've got a motion that's on the table. It has been moved and seconded. So I'm going to ask that we vote on that. On that. So the 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 recommendation is an action plan prepared before the end of 2024, which is December 2024. So all those in favour of that motion. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So that that has. Um, that's been moved, seconded, and passed. Um, the other recommendation is that the baseline assessment is endorsed. We'll just take a quick vote on that because I don't think there's going to be a particular problem with that. But as you, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that concludes the recommendations for that for that report. Um, and then I'll take that to cabinet at the appropriate time. And we'll see how those recommendations go down. So thanks, uh, thanks, Anna and, and Jeremy. I know you're staying now for the next item, but I'm still going to thank you for your attendance for that item. Um, so item eight is the Future High Streets Fund quarterly update. Uh, and we've got Alice on this one as well. So I'm going to uh, hand over to Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so you have in front of you the, the quarterly update. We're used to seeing it now. It's broken down by different projects. Uh, I spoke quite a lot the last time we presented it, and uh, Alice sat there looking disappointed. She hadn't contributed as much as she wanted to, and she's already reaching for the microphone. Um, so, Alice, would you like to run us through the report? Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, just really keen to update, really, because a lot has happened since the last... Uh, update that we gave this committee which I'm sure is music to everyone's ears um, so yeah just getting into it um, project by project within the program starting with the college quarter uh, the college have submitted their planning application and we're hoping that that will go to planning committee in October and hopefully we should have a decision then too so we all await that eagerly um, the tender exercise to appoint a contractor for the demolition of the co-op retail store was concluded back in August and we've appointed a contractor called Armac after a competitive tender process. Um, they've been commissioned to carry out the demo of the retail store as mentioned uh, as well as the internal strip out of the Victorian uh, side of the building in preparation for its refurb into the second enterprise centre and they'll also be removing the uh, canopy on St Edith's Square um, in the next few weeks. They've actually started on site today, so that's really great to see, a bit of activity. I'm sure we'll start getting a lot of kind of questions and comments in the near future on that as well. 
Uh, moving on to mid-lentry, again, positive news. We've completed the legal agreement with Peer Group for the acquisition of the units to the south of mid-lentry. So just for context, that's the old Christopher's Jewellers where it wraps around to what was Timpson's. Um, like I say, that's all completed. All the units there are vacant with the exception of the Pound Bakery who will vacate at the end of November. In the interim, we've taken on their lease. Uh, site investigations and surveys are due to start on those units in the coming weeks, so hopefully we'll be able to get started there soon, which is great news. Uh, designs for the flexible retail space that will go in place of those units once demolished is ongoing. We have got those signed off by the programme board and we're currently reviewing designs for the public realm area that will go in front of that building. Um, and hopefully we can bring an update on that next time we present. Moving on to Castle Gateway. Oh, sorry. I forgot to mention about the Peel Cafe. So yeah, we've got the planning application for the Peel Cafe also approved. Um, we're currently in negotiations with Nationwide still on the legal agreement for their move, um, but all's progressing well with no hiccups so far. They've completed their test fit exercise and we're just trying to finalise the last few things with them. Um, moving on to Castle Gateway. Um, last time we spoke quite extensively about Market Street and some of the concerns we had around um, those properties. Um, we're pleased to say that we've now managed to structurally secure those buildings. We've put some kind of temporary propping in place, which means we can carry on with our surveys and our work, which is great. Um, we've also got a structural heritage specialist engineer that has come and surveyed the property. They've got a report that's coming to us in the first week of October that should detail um, what the scope of the repairs truly is and what they think we can do with that building. Um, their initial feedback has been really positive and despite the very kind of damning timber report that we spoke about last time, they do think that the building is salvageable and that there are things that we can do to bring it back into use, which is great news again. Um, talking about Castle Bridge next, we're still refining designs for what will go in place of the current bridge um, and we're in talks with highways about what we're going to do with that area too in terms of the public realm. So again, we hope to bring a bit more of an update on that next time once it's passed through Reba stage three. Um, move kind of on to engagement and comms. We're still working with the internal TBC comms team on press releases as things are starting to move forward now. There's a lot for us to be reporting back out to people, which is great. Um, we've also started some engagement with local businesses because as mentioned, now that we're starting on site and things are moving, uh, people obviously are going to be affected and they want to know what's happening and when. So we're endeavouring to keep people updated as much as possible. Um, moving on to budget and timescales. Uh, timescales first, we're currently on programme, although it is looking very tight. Um, and we've got things kind of running concurrently to try and keep to our March 24 deadline. Um, in terms of the costs, we've had a updated cost plan uh, with Reba Stage 3 from our lead contractor, McBain's. Um, we've presented that to Programme Board um, a few weeks ago. Um, we are continuing to refine that cost plan as more survey information and design information becomes available. Um, it's a hot topic at the moment and it's something we are continually reviewing as more information becomes available. Um, it's worth noting that we do have some contingency funds allocated that we're hoping might alleviate some of the pressures on our budget. And additionally, We'll just look to try and you know value engineer where possible to kind of bring down costs because as we know with inflation and the rising cost of materials we are potentially stretched in some areas of our budget looks like might have questions on thanks that. alice <laughs> <laughs> questions or comments andy um what does value engineering mean You know what I mean by value engineer. In a nutshell, we are looking for ways in which we can optimise our designs to save money where possible. So, smart solutions. If I could add to that, Mr sure. Chairman. Uh, it's, it, it's about designing out cost, but also, as I alluded to in the previous report, it gives us an opportunity to look at climate uh, climate change issues so if for example we look at some of the shop units we've built in Tamworth in the past 
where you've got three storey high units that are just one single floor, that's a lot of space to fill and heat. Well, actually, is that appropriate? And can we design things differently to be a single storey height? For, 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 as an example, so, so it's about not just about cost, but that is something that's, that's important. It's about taking on the points we raised earlier about embedding the climate change and stuff like that. So there's stuff we can grab a hold of now at design stage before we get too committed to, uh, to a particular material or a particular look or a particular void space that we've got to, you know, uh, 30 years of, uh, of heating on and stuff like that. So, so that's, that's what this, this, this element is about. Sure. Happy Andy. No, that doesn't sound like value engineering to me. <laughs> value engineering usually means that we've, we, we're going to cut down on, on certain materials and make things cheaper and easier to do in order to save cost. And I worry that we've, we've not embedded a, a, um, a good enough contingency, as was warned um, quite some time ago, with the uh, impending inflation uh, issue that was, a, that was, that was arising. Um, absolutely, I completely agree with building in climate change stuff, um, but that was just told to us that it, was, it would be expensive. Um, that doesn't say to me value engineering. So I worry a bit. Comment, Mr. Chairman, Jerry. the point I was raising was we take those opportunities at this design stage. Uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, using cheaper materials, etc., uh, for, for me, it's not about cutting corners, for want of a better phrase, or, or just dabbing a bit of cladding on. Uh, it's about making solid decisions at the design stage rather than, r rather than later on going, well, that looks pretty. How can we do it a different way? It's about making those solid decisions early on so we're not scrimping and scraping on materials. We still get a quality output, but we get a quality output that we can, that we can afford to deliver. Okay. Paul. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's just going back onto a little bit what Simon said. I, I, you know, I agree that every penny is a prisoner, really, on all capital expenditure projects, particularly when it's government money or our money. Uh, but I do think that uh, we've got to look at this project and maybe redo the numbers that if we want it to be green or greener as we can get it at this moment in time, then I think the budget's got to change. Uh, if you start to say we're now looking at value engineering, which is an acumen of cost cutting, then that's going to do two failures. One, not achieve what we want, and B, make it not as green as we want. And I think we have to look at that seriously now, and I seriously think that it's time to take a break, take a pause, take a breath, and, and come back with a little bit more information about that. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thanks, Paul. I think, I think maybe maybe we do have to be a little bit um, conscious on the on the wordings that we that we use maybe alice yeah just to come back on that it's about striking the balance and looking for the opportunities to do that and where there are opportunities and it doesn't mean a you know a compromise exactly on quality or our outputs then that's where it is going to be done i think it would be remiss of us to come here and say that we're not looking for opportunities if it is possible but yeah just to reassure everyone it doesn't mean a compromise on quality Anna I just wanted to give an example just to put a bit of context around what we're talking about so the enterprise center um, the building that you know it's Victorian it's um it, it's to be retrofitted it's a it's a challenging space to put in something that's modern and up to date and fit for modern purpose. Um, but initial plans from the um, architects and the design team showed them moving a load of walls around. You know, for every wall that was moved, you need steel lintel going in, and it's a cost of about fifty thousand pounds. The implications of some of these very small decisions that were being just initially put on a plan because it, it looked right in plan form the rooms were square and the access was here and blah 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 it costs a lot of money now we've designed all that out because we've gone do you know what actually if the room isn't quite square and it's got a bit of an l shape it still works because you can have storage down that end you can have desks down the other and it still works for us as an authority and it would still be the same lettable space just a bit misshapen so that's how we've designed and gone through the design process to cut costs because actually those initial costs weren't quite 
operationally necessary. And so, and so, for example, the frontage, um, we've now got planning consent for it, but on the frontage on Coles Hill, we had a recessed doorway, and we've actually removed that, and we brought it back to the original building line, um, which isn't quite symmetrical, but it's not bad. So, you know, that was a decision that we had to take. But if we'd, if we'd kept that recessed doorway in and, and moved a doorway over here and we had to move a pole at one point, it was, it was, it was very expensive. So actually, we've, by doing what we've done, we've minimised costs and we've, we've maximised floor space. Um, and so we've, we've delivered a better product as a result. And there's no less quality in the, the end offer. Thank, yeah, thanks. Just to yeah, sort of absolute thanks, Anna. I think, I think absolutely they're, they're, they're good examples and um, perhaps reassures committee that it's perhaps um, the language or the terminology used is perhaps um, in, a, in a, a different context to perhaps what some members might think. Andy. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, uh, thanks for the example. That that's really good. I, th I do think, though, that um, to sort of ally some of the fears, I, th I definitely think we need to be looking at um, some kind of mechanism where we can have a bit of oversight and sign off over what we're what what we're going to be cutting back on. If we are going to be, cut no, don't, I don't want to be sitting here as a committee watching over your shoulders, making every single decision and signing that off. But at the same time, I kind of feel as if we are as if if we're reaching a situation where uh, money is getting tight and we need some kind of um you know we need to be cutting back on some stuff in order to see the project through and that that's fair enough but there, there needs to be some kind of oversight of that Anna yeah just to say that the program board that meets meets monthly has that oversight of the whole program in terms of both the time scales the governance how it's delivered and the budgets so we give regular updates obviously through a, a, a what we call a dashboard which is very similar to a committee report just set out slightly differently but it runs through all the projects and runs through the challenges and the risks um what we've done and what we're expecting to do all those sorts of things um so so really they're the decision making body that we have to run all the designs through and all the costs through and they're currently comfortable with where we are thanks thanks anna uh, yeah, sorry. Just make it quick. Um, can I suggest that the at the um, probably at the audit and governance um, subcommittee that we we take that that information to that subcommittee and we we when I was talking about oversight, I was thinking more from um, from the councillors um, and that maybe maybe we take that information to that that subcommittee and we we have a look there. I'm I'm gonna just sort of come in and say I guess that's that's a decision for you guys at the audit and governance sub subcommittee when that next meets and i'm sure i'm sure anna will take that on board anna and, and also to say that the audit and governance subcommittee is purely there to check and challenge the risk elements around the program specifically and that's why it was set up to do that thank you so michelle next thank you chair um, no, alice it was a really good kind of presentation and it's, it's, and it's, it's one of those reports that I'm really excited to see. It's such a big thing for our town centre and to see that kind of moving forward is great. I completely concur with what Councillor Cooper said in terms of that we don't want to be cutting back on things unnecessarily and, there has to, and because it is such a flagship what we don't want to see is oh actually we had to change X, Y and Z because we couldn't afford to do it. If there is a question of stepping on standards and I don't mean building standards and but as in kind of the concepts then actually can we come back and get more budget etc etc the second part of that was Alice you made a comment about things running kind of concurrently and 2024 does that affect in any way shape or form our budget and our funding from government if we are not ready by 2024 Thank, thanks Michelle I just I just want to make a comment here I, I, I've not from the report, I didn't hear anything about cutting of, of standards. And, I, and also, I, th I think I just want to perhaps stress from what I understand of the report, I don't see from a cost-cutting point of view. I think, I think Anna made a couple of good examples of where costs could be reduced, but that not from a cost-cutting point of view of, of a 
of an end of an end product. So, clarify what I meant there. I didn't mean it from a kind of that standpoint. It was things like, for example, moving a doorway in and out, unless it fundamentally changes the fabric or the frontage of the building. Frankly, get on with it. I don't mind. If it's something more significant than that, then yes, I'm sure cabinet are aware. I'm sure that kind of the officers of the programme board are aware. But the rest of the councillors who have sat through presentations and have kind of gone, that's a brilliant thing to do. It'd be really nice to get some sort of update of when, if something more significant was to change, then to tell us because it is it's something we want to be shouting from the rooftops about and saying, look what we're doing. And in 2024, you're going to see something amazing, hopefully. Thanks, thanks, Michelle. Uh, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, um, if anything significant changes to the project, then that would have to go back through Cabinet and the governance system. Uh, if there are any changes to the outcomes of the project, so should we decide not to do one of the, one of the projects within the programme, uh, we have to go through government to, to seek permission to change that. So, so anything, I'm not going to say anything bigger than a doorway, but anything big and significant would have to go through a, a series of governance depending on, uh, on whether it's a, a, a significant change in the government's eyes or a change of direction in terms of the stuff we've just talked about this evening locally. Uh, but that would have to go through yeah. a, a, a cabinet decision to change that, that programme. Um, and we're also involved with government and, and we have to feedback and give, give regular updates. Uh, in terms of the, the budget uh, and the spend of the government money, uh, we're, we're still well on target to, to, to spend that um, in terms of delivering that part of the project. Uh, what we should never lose sight of, uh, and I'm using this prompt as an opportunity, is the beautification elements of the town centre were not included in the Future High Street Fund project because they were deliberately excluded by government and anything we contributed to that bit sits outside the project. Um, so they, they will be the bits that you'll see after the 2024 March deadline is where we, we do the additional bits that we want to do that are funded outside the project and, and separately. Thank you. Anna. Yeah, just to say, I can't, I can't recall a single conversation in any of our design meetings that we have regularly with the McBain's multidisciplinary team and the architects and, you know, uh, all, all the drainage and civils, etc. Um, I don't think we've ever had a conversation where we've said we need to cut costs because we're not, we're not in that space. Yes, things are costing more money, but it's actually a lot of that cost is, is outside of our control. And it's, it's just something that we have to accept, unfortunately. Um, so we've, we've never been in a space where we're looking to cut costs, but through it, an iterative design process, costs have been cut. Some of the projects' costs have gone up because we've asked for, for a little bit more floor space or a bit more height here or something you know, slightly different. Um, you know, we, we're still, we're at the REBA stage three sort of stage now, which we've got good designs. They're at quite a good detail. It's allowing us now to start to tender for contractors, which we're currently out with the Peel Cafe uh, and the tech, which is going to be a joint, a joint project with one contractor, we hope. Um, you know, we need to still see what, what they come back with with their costs, because they could be a lot lower than our estimates. And what we think the work will cost could be could be different. Um, the demolition, for example, of the co-op, um, you know, we estimated that to be a million pounds and it, it came in under that. Now that, that's a saving for the college as it happens because it's, it's, it's all wrapped up with their finances and costs. But you know, that was a lot lower than we were expecting. So we still don't know yet and until those contractor tendering processes sort of go forwards and, and come back in, um, that's when we will know what the true cost is at that point. Thanks, Anna. Jeremy. Sorry, Anna. Okay, excellent. Um, John. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, yeah. The um, the demolition of the co-op. And so, oh, by the way, the recessed doorway. I think is obviously a the recessed doorway serves no useful purpose for anything. So it it, it would be a, an asset to the, the building to remove it, and it won't cause any significant uh, change. I think. But um, we're obviously going through a huge air. Uh, period of um, upheaval with the demolition there's going to be dust there's going to be noise it's going to be really um, um, well unpleasant I suppose in a lot of ways um, but what I, I want to know is the timeline for the middle entry 
section of the other thing because we get the I understand that the um, the carp's coming down imminently now uh, in the next few weeks or whatever. When do you expect the middle entry uh, development and the demolition to be going ahead? And how will this affect the businesses in middle entry? Um, will they have to close because you're obviously taking the roof off, demol uh, demolishing the, the, the bridge piers. Um, how is this going to affect businesses? And will it um, prevent access, obviously, for people having to go through that? Just to come back on that, um, we're not there yet. So that's not running. I know I said some things are running concurrently in the programme. That will not be happening at the same time as co-op demolition. We're some way off that. We're only just starting site investigations. In terms of how that's going to impact the businesses that are still trading in middle entry, that's discussions that we will have with peer group to manage that process. And obviously, as their tenants, they take a lot of responsibility in how we'll, how we'll negotiate that process with them. Jeremy. Just, just to add something to that, um, in terms of the bridge parts of middle entry, they are part of the asset that's owned by peer group. So that's a piece of work that, as Alice said, we're, we're, we've still got to do. In terms of the shop units at the back of this building, down from Christopher's around the corner, uh, we now have possession of those. That is running at a different time period, uh, time timeline to the bridge parts of the of, of middle entry because we have control of those. It may happen at the same time, but because we have control of them, we can uh, we, we've got more uh, we're more confident in what we're doing in terms of the timeline for those because we can crack on as soon as we've done the surveys. We're only just starting the surveys with the with the bridge units, and we've got to negotiate with peer group. So so that's why Alice has said we're, we're not at that position yet because it's sort of. It's two different owners, so therefore two different levels of control. Thank you. Anna. Uh, okay. <laughs> and that's fine. Um, <laughs> I think um, we are looking at logistics in terms of removing the canopy and the bridges. Um, our ideal situation would be that the businesses stay open and are accessible and that that route through is still available to everybody all the time. You know, it could be that we do some sort of overnight weekend type operation where everything gets winched off. Um, and for the bridges, it, you know, is it possible to put something underneath them to catch debris and still have people walking through? Those are the sorts of conversations that we're having, but we've, we've not to date had a conversation which has started with, right, we need to close everything. It's been the other way around. Like, how do we keep it open and get this very tricky thing done um, with the least amount of disruption? Thanks. Anna. Jeremy again. The Jeremy. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was going to add to John's concerns and woes um, in terms of the impact on businesses. This is not the only place where we're going to have that issue. We're, we're, we benefit from the co-op being a standalone building that we can crack on with. Uh, but in terms of middle entry, the bridge units, uh, the bridge parts and, and this building at the back of here, uh, we've got some concerns and, that we have to address in terms of looking after businesses. We've got the same with the castle entry bridge because we've got to make sure that's removed and replaced with limited impact because that is a gateway to our town centre and that links the heritage to the, uh, to the, to the town centre and Market Street. Uh, so this is this discussion is a live discussion. It's something we're we're considering uh, as we go through in different ways in different areas. But it's about achieving the big stuff and the big regeneration, but also mitigating that short-term impact. Thanks, Jeremy. Anna. Yeah, and, and just to say that the McBain's team are currently engaging with fabricators and bridge builders to look at the logistics behind uh, putting a bridge over where we've got one currently, how do we take it out and put one back in? And it might be that it's winched in in one piece overnight, um, literally, and just wake up the next day and there will be a new bridge in its place. So, you know, there are lots, there are lots of things that to, to look at. It's a very challenging site, the bridge area, how to get something, um, a large load in along Market Street or George Street, carrying such a big structure, for example, and dangling it over the heritage buildings, John, don't faint. But um, but, but these are these are things that, that we are having to to look at. Thanks, Anna. 
I put, uh, thank you for your concern about my, uh, my mental health. <laughs> it's very much appreciated. Um, so really what we can say is the, the carp's coming down now. The next phase of demolition will be the buildings at the rear of here that we... It will be, be the Peel Cafe. Oh, the Peel Cafe. Demolition piece. Yeah. Um, and the materials will have to come through the building's front door to be disposed of. We can't go out the back. So there will be disruption so there will around here, out into the back, right out outside here. There will be a lot of trucks and um, demolition uh, transport going through the town over the next... A little bit, a little bit for this one, but it's a much smaller extension, so yeah. it's, the yeah. impact isn't going to be as great as you would have yeah. for the co-op. But yeah, the co-op the co demolition is a significant yeah. piece of work. Um, but we are looking at, through the demolition consent, how to mitigate that disruption. So, for example, when we have enough space on the site, if you remember there's that, that rear yard behind um, the co-op building, it might be a, it might be possible to get materials crushed on site, for example, with a crushing machine, which will actually make disposing of them much easier. We might even be able to recycle them within the project. It, it, so there's there's a, there's a lot going on with that, but there will be some disruption definitely with the co-op and with the middle entry bit, wherever that is up there, yeah. um, just because of its proximity to so many different buildings and businesses within the town. Yeah. Well, obviously, we're going to expect a lot of people um, commenting on this over the next few months, yeah. positive and uh, and negative, I'm sure. Uh, just finally, uh, you did you mentioned uh, the the canopy um, that's coming down very shortly. I think most people will be applauding that, apart from the pantry or whoever it is in uh, uh, in middle entry. But um, the the question is, uh, what are you going to do with it? Um, is it being thrown away or is it being re-erected somewhere? What's, what's, what's the plan? It's going to be scrapped and that will be because no other reason that it's not suitable to be re-erected elsewhere. It's past its lifespan and I believe it's past its warranty. I don't think it would be safe for us to use it. Whilst we should obviously look to try and reuse things as much as possible and be conscious of that, in this case, sadly, it just won't work. I don't think too many people will be sorry to see it go. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I think most councillors have recently had a representation from somebody who uh, works on the market who is who's very keen for it to stay, but anyway. Um, can I just, first of all, Chair, um, and perhaps I should have done this at the beginning, as I've declared on many occasions in the past, I am a director of the co-op. Um, and um, so the co-op building, the, the heritage building, is very close to my heart. So first of all, can I just ask that when we're referring to the co-op demolition, that we remember that the heritage building is the co-op building, it's the original co-op building, and that is very much staying. So I think that's it's really important that we we remember that in the way that we talk about about the site and so on. Um, it's only the the sixties, dare I say, monstrosity um, that is going. So my question is about the heritage part, which, as I say, is very close to my heart. It's a very important building in terms of Tamworth's history. Um, you mentioned the recessed doorway. Do you mean the corner door? Yeah, no. There's one on, the, on Coles Hill, but it's like a secondary door. It sort of, um, actually sort of just stepped into it before going in. The one that leads up to the staircase? No. 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 Well, there's another one. There's another one. All oh, right, okay. Further, further down. Further down, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I know what you mean, yeah. Um, so and, and and I can completely understand the point about you know restructuring the inside and, and, and not necessarily knocking down walls and putting in RSJs and things. But uh, my question really is: Are we keeping the uh, co-op the, the the lettering outside? That's very important. Um, and what about the features inside? Because there's a lot of uh, stained glass and old wood staircases and all that sort of thing. Is that all staying? Yeah, it's all to be kept. And actually, we're hoping that when the 
the, the demolition contractor goes in and starts doing what we call the soft strip, which is sort of carpets and curtains, I, we think they're going to uncover a lot more because quite a bit has been sort of like boarded over with sort of like ply materials or etc. Um, and we know that some of the beams, um, there's one room at the top which has got boxed in beams and we think, you know, when that all comes down we might have some like another feature. So we do think actually... Yes, we're keeping the features and we hope to find a few more as we go through the process. Not specifically for this committee, but I'd really come I'd I'd really love to come and have a look when when if it's possible because I think it is a really interesting building. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think if it's safe to do so after the contractors have gone in, then um, I see no reason why not. Thank you, Chair. Very, very quickly. We mentioned some time ago, uh, Anna, about the, the War Memorial a tablet that was in the co-op by the lifts. Have you, have you not found it? Has it been moved? Or? It isn't there in the building presently. We should probably check with... I will find out for you uh, whether, <laughs> whether we took it out. <laughs> but... Um, I don't. It's not been mentioned, so I don't. I don't know either. But I can. I can check. Okay. Any other questions or comments from members? No. Okay. Well, we have a recommendation that the report is noted. I'll just amend that to endorsed. I think. Um, I think that that's what we. Sure. Sorry, you said any more comments. I, 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 sh I was very remiss because I should have said right at the beginning how pleased I am to see that, that such good progress is being made because it has felt for a while like nothing was really happening, but now it looks like it's starting to come together. So well done all. Ab absolutely, and I think this is something that, th that I think we will, we will see with these sort of projects that there's, there's always a lot of planning um, and then things suddenly, suddenly happen. I think that's sort of thing I've noticed with large projects. But, um, yeah, so we have um, a recommendation in the report where we're endorsing, and I'll, I'll move that. Just look for a seconder. Paul, all those in favour? Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, um, Anna, Jeremy, <laughs> <laughs> Alice. It's getting cold. Um, you're welcome. Welcome to uh, to run off and warm yourself up. Um, item nine is a forward plan. Um, I have looked at the forward plan. I don't believe there's anything on that um, in addition to what we're already looking at on our work programme um, or, or required to do, uh, unless anybody else has any uh, comments on the forward plan. I'll move on to the next item. Excellent. Uh, item 10, our working group updates. Um, the first one I have on there is... Um, HGV drivers. Ben, is it still going? Uh, I can confirm, Chair, that we will be meeting next week. Okay, uh, excellent. To start, to start the time. Shh, don't tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll be meeting next week, Chair, to start that piece of work. Excellent. That's, that's, that's great. Uh, so uh, should I have an update for next meeting, hopefully. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much. Um, with regard to the Travellers Working Group, uh, I've, I've, I've met with the, um, with the Chair of Health and Wellbeing and we sort of discussed that probably rather than, uh, as I suggested at the last meeting, the Health and Wellbeing take on this item, um, I think we came to a, a conclusion that we would do it as a joint, a joint um, piece of work with that scrutiny committee, so I'll be setting something up with, uh, with, the, with the chair of that, that committee. Um, the third working group is the transport integration, um, and I believe there's, some, there's quite a large piece of work being done on it. I know we're, we're getting to the, 
the close of play and it's been a long long evening but I think I'll just let Richard just give us a summary overview of what work's been done and where we go from it thank you I will give a very short overview and then I'll ask Paul to give an equally short sort of view um, but Mr Chairman this the, the work that myself and Paul and to the others who are on the committee I do apologize for not including you with the, with the recent political shifting uh, in Tamworth we weren't sure on the what the balance of this committee was so we just thought it was best that as vice chair and someone who I assume we'll stay on the committee as one of the members of the controlling group who's cracked on with it, but we, for any future, we will endeavour to include you. Uh, but myself and Councillor Turner over the summer met with, uh, no, not over the summer, I can't remember where it was, we met with the Reva buses um, to have a broad discussion about bus timetables uh, and potentially lengthening them into the evenings um, as part of the future high street program part of it is to boost the the nighttime economy um we had informal chats as well with members of the business community who own late nights or late evening establishments uh, they're also called pubs um and one of the things they said that the uh that people would some would people didn't want to necessarily come in on on weekdays because they were driving uh, and a bus aspect would be uh, and, uh, uh they would be used as an alternative uh, as well as staff members who would be working to 11 12 o'clock um if they couldn't get home uh other than their parent picking them up uh the example we had was someone from work welcome standing out to the town center that's not really feasible uh late night so if a late night bus service would be operational that would be fantastic for the employees finishing at that time being able to jump on the last bus home uh, rather than relying on parents to pick them up. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Councillor Turner. Uh, we did get a, a proposal from Arriva that basically gave some costings and some uh, on some extensions to some timetables. Um, he's presented it in a very, very nice format. Um, and I think he's got one for everybody. I hope he has. Um, <laughs> what, can, can I just say we are approaching half past eight we can extend the meeting um, uh, or do we think do we feel that this is better left for another I think Mr Chairman another, well, sorry my, my recommendation Mr Chairman would be if we take these away and have a look at Mr yeah. uh, uh, Councillor Turner's yeah. presentation and then bring it back on the 11th of October it's only two weeks away yeah um, Paul's indicated so I'm going to Turn mine off now. Oh, yeah, I agree. I Chair, agree with that as a recommendation. Uh, thank you. Um, for you, my colleagues down there, I have printed some presentations off. Please take them away. Have a look. You should have one. No, it's the same. They're all the same. They're all the same. Um, oh, there you go. I know I do. Uh, just to um, give you a quick overview. Basically, we spoke with uh, the general manager of Reva to say if we put the buzz or if you put the buzzies on till midnight on all the eight um, routes in Tamworth and, and to Litchfield, what would be the cost based on a three year period, which the numbers are in there. Um, and to be perfectly honest, we've looking at several options. There is a cost to do it if it was TVC that did it. There's a cost in there that would tell you if individual household, we've based it on 20,000 that pay their council tax. So it works out at 50, 58p a week if you did it just on that measure. I'm not saying you do or you don't. We are looking at, there's an integrated strategy for transport that's been put together now for the county. And it's very interesting that Arriva general manager, Jamie, works two days in Tamworth and three days in Telford, and Shropshire didn't stop their subsidy of buzzies, where Staffordshire did. So we put this uh, bit of work together, uh, and we will, when you've had time to digest it, we're not trying to rush anything through. It would be good if we can get it into February's budget. And there's no doubt about it, as we spoke to a lot of businesses, the, the idea of trying to get taxis working is not gonna happen. It's a broken model. But buzzies till midnight is a way. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paul. And I think um, I think it would be sensible to review that um, at the next meeting. A couple of quick questions. Michelle. Oh, 
uh, thank you. Um, no, that's really, really interesting. I mean, just like really quick perusing of figures there. I'm more than happy if you want me to help on this at all. I used to work at Calvary Meeting Council oh, right. um, and I was responsible at the time for all of the sustainable transport stuff there, which included their bus centre relocation and all of the bits and pieces that went with that. So that included additional routes, additional kind of stops and also additional hours. So I've got quite a lot of personal experience from a few years ago, so more than happy if anyone does want any help on that. I've got loads of stuff that I can potentially bring to the table. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks Michelle. I would, I would suggest that if you want to get involved in that working group, then tie it with Paul and, and Richard. Sarah. Just to tie into the first item on the evening, you know, thinking about becoming net zero, this is a no-brainer. When we think about the different ways that we could have different fuels, different, you know, electronically charged buses, um, a conference I was just at that was looking at use of hydrogen for the bus service that's currently operating in Birmingham. So linking everything together, this sounds like a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, I'll you. Chair, you are right that electric buses is not really the answer. The answer is hydrogen. And if that's the case, we'll have to relocate the bus garage because you can't put hydrogen mm. in the centre. And that's something that we're speaking about anyway, because they're going to have to spend a lot of money on that, that building. And that's pointless spending a lot of money on that building, only to re re need it to be relocated. So there's a bit of a bigger picture, you're right. Same. Thanks, Paul. Sure. Thank you for doing this, and I shall take it away and read it with interest. There are other... Um, shows in town, you know, there are lots of projects up and down the country for um, cooperative bus services and community bus services and ring and ride and all that sort of thing. And we probably need to be looking at those as well, um, just to make sure we've got the full <coughs> picture. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, the, uh, the, you know, the initial response is Reva, we're in town, they are doing it. How much would it cost just to rent a window? And that's what they've come back with in them numbers. Uh, yes, if you then ask more people to get involved, A, you could get a better result, but you can also complicate it. So I am conscious that there's no point in, in, in overcomplicating a situation. And if you've run it for a, a, a minimum of a three-year trial period, because you do need to get momentum, you do need to, to say to people, even if the bus is initially run around empty, I don't care. You know, it's not all about that it's about building confidence about getting the nighttime economy going and it's a small cost really per year well i take your point john if it's quick very quick um yeah uh, sarah what you say is absolutely uh correct this is a huge going to be a huge bonus for tamworth if we can get get this up and running but what i would suggest is when you're doing the costings um put into it a good good wadge of cash for publicity because if people don't know about it doesn't matter how good it is it'll it, it, it won't get it you've got to shout it and scream it from the, the the rooftops tamworth is buzzing or whatever slogans you want to use something really up up tempo get tamworth moving by buzz absolutely and uh make sure everybody knows about it that's uh that's all it is no, just uh, very quickly on Chury's point, it was just the starting point and why I'm so eager to have your input is for the other things about the community travel and the ring and ride stuff and as well as uh, Michelle's uh, input from her professional background previously be fantastic. Uh, but as, as I alluded to in the opening, we could have a discussion on this for about an hour and a half. Uh, so I would very much recommend we end it now and leave it to the next meeting if that's okay with you, Chair. Absolutely, it's what I recommended we did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, excellent. We'll look at that in at the next meeting. Item 11 is our committee work plan. I'm just going to just run through a couple of things. The, um, the funding of public toilets, which is out on our work plan. Um, uh, there was a petition that went to Council in July. Uh, health and wellbeing scrutiny is looking at it. I suggest we remove that item and health and wellbeing look at that. Um, and then the other item, which is the strategy for older buildings, um, I met with the chair of corporate scrutiny and we agreed that that could be picked up as the overarching asset management strategy and I feel that's more appropriate. Any other comments? Excellent. Thank you very much. I'll close the meeting at 29 minutes past seven, eight even. Thank you very much for uh, 
attending. Thank you. Good night.